I became a scientist, I did it because I wanted to save the world. In fact, I wanted to make the world a, a really fantastic place. And it's not just because of residual Catholic guilt. I have to say that actually all scientists and all technologists and engineers that I've ever met have that same dream. And you've heard in the last couple of days that we've seen technologies just accelerate, actually exponentially. And if we want to see those technologies get to a point where we actually are able to have the world we dream and the world we want, that everyone is equal and everyone has a good opportunity to have the richness and the fulfillment of the full human opportunity, then we need to make sure that we get the alignment of these technologies and the policy settings that government and public service have to create set right so that we're able to achieve that. So today, I want to talk about this from the perspective of the autonomous vehicle, which you've heard a lot about already. And then I want to look at what are the policy settings that are needed in order for us to see this really come to fruition in a way that will make us be able to see the true worth happening. So let's just recap what we've seen the last few days. We've seen that car transport is really very inefficient and has a huge impact on humanity in many ways, financially and individually. We've seen that autonomous vehicles, if they were introduced, would have an immediate huge benefit on so many aspects. And we've also seen, if we go back to 120 years ago, the rapid change of which even the introduction of the car, where we see horses within 13 years being completely replaced by uh, cars, is something that we're going to see replicated here, but at an even greater rate. We've also seen that countries all around the world are showing, whether from developing nations to developed nations, that they're hungry and ready for this sort of opportunity and for autonomous vehicles to come into place. But are we ready yet? What is it that we're actually looking at that has to allow us to uh, get to a point where autonomous vehicles are going to be picking me up, going off and having a life of their own, creating a business for me, and then coming and picking me up in the afternoon? Well, the first thing is, we have to get the policy settings right. In Australia, last year, in May, the government actually identified the need to put something in place, but the policy has been set up so that, in fact, you still have to have a licence, you still have to sit behind the car, and, and already we're about 11th out of 20 nations that are preparing for autonomous vehicles. If we want to look at the best country, the Netherlands have actually pushed the boundaries on policy settings, and they're allowing the autonomous systems or cars to have no driver and that they've already got a thousand traffic lights ready to engage with autonomous vehicles. If we look at the USA, 23 different states have already identified laws and put them in place and there's 53 of them but the problem is that each state has got a completely different approach and if you think globally you, with the UN, they have the Vienna Convention for uh, Road and Traffic, you would expect that we'd have a uniform approach. But let's look at the number of countries that are signed up there. The good news is, though, that if we look at some aspects of our world, such as if you take a kilogram of apples and you weigh it here and you weigh it overseas, you will still get a kilogram because we've got international standards. This is something that we haven't quite achieved yet with what we want to have with autonomous systems, but also with any of the technologies you've heard about so far this week. So what's still to do in Australia? Well, we went through and counted up the number of laws that still need to be changed to make autonomous vehicles happen in our society today. We need to change 700 of them. We still have to come to terms with insurance. Who is liable? Who's the owner of the vehicle? Is it that the person who drives it or sits back and be driven around by it? Or is it the person who's actually running the business? Is it a programmer who actually developed the software to decide how things operate? Or is it the car manufacturer itself? Even just things like getting the actuaries enough statistics so they can make decisions on what uh, to charge as an insurance premium it still takes time to happen. And the thing is that there's some fundamental changes in the way we all think, whole, wholly think about insurance, such as the no-fault liability. And then at the end of the day, how are we going to pay for this? 
because now we use a lot of money coming from petrol excise, from registrations. But if things are going to happen where there are less cars on the road and that we're going to have a very different business model, we've got to work out from a policy setting p situation, how are we going to pay for all this? And then we've already heard uh, quite a bit about the fact that security and privacy are big issues. But the thing is, we've got to make uh, policy settings and laws to work out how we manage that. The next thing is, too, that we've got to think about from a, um, a policy setting, what is the ethical uh, considerations? You've heard about this earlier this week, about the, the conundrum of who do you go for and who makes the decision on what uh, decision will be made by an autonomous, autonomous car when it gets into a, a sticky situation. And we've also got to get to a point where we realise, and this is where policy settings are terribly important, how is it that we're going to manage the displaced people of all the new technologies, and how are we going to make sure that we don't end up with a society that has a job or doesn't have a job? If we look at autonomous vehicles in the USA, they expect five million people to lose their jobs. This will mean that there'll be $20 billion worth of salaries that won't be paid. And it's not really clear, and some, enough work hasn't been put in place yet, to figure out how do we transition people who are often in uh, lesser skilled jobs to ones where we're creating a society where the jobs are much higher skilled and require a different level of education. So how do we prepare people and bring them along with us? These are socially difficult questions. They are ones which are often called wicked problems. And this is something that goes through looking at the fact that no one person will think and look at the problem from the same way. So you will have no one view is correct. You'll have ideological constraints which will make people choose one direction or another. There's many possible interventions that can happen. There's political constraints because of the basis of a political party in power. There's economic constraints, and there's also the tendency for illogical and multi-valued approaches. And finally, we've got that natural tendency for many people to resist change. We have a situation, too, where we have a sort of a herd mentality, where quite often we try to solve these problems by looking at what was done before. And going back to the car uh, analogy, when we first saw cars being developed, they tried to just replace the horse with a person on sitting on top of a motor. We can't afford to have policy settings in this way. We need to have a whole new approach. But let's look at the way things have happened, because over the long period of time, we've seen things change. So we start with a paradigm emerges, that it comes up and a bubble appears. Then it goes down and we get disappointed because a bubble bursts. We get a period where there's a recession or a, a, a turning point where eventually we get an agreement or an understanding that we can adopt some technology or paradigm and we get used to it. And then eventually it has its day and we find that the whole cycle goes again. We've been probably experiencing that long hiatus period for some time now, but we're now getting to the point where we've got that big question mark we have to answer. What is going to happen where we're at that cuffs, where all these new technologies are going to rocket up and really impact us? And it's at this point that often governments get to a situation where they're just not able to be prepared to make that change because they've been so used to being able to coast along and their ways of thinking and approaching things is really not ready yet. And this is where we are today. So what we need to do, though, is to have a successful, and this is the, I guess, the scientist is me trying to make it into an equation, successful transition as individuals, as organisations and societies require two things. We need this top-down theory that is the desired state of this new paradigm, but we also need to have this coming up from the bottom, and this is where we come in, of data analysis that drives good decision-making. So Euron Roos, who, uh, Roos, who is a South Australian think tank amazing man, has come up with some things which he recommends we have to think about. The first is we need to have a wise, bold and active parliament. We need to have a strategic perspective and increase the prosperity for all citizens, not just a few. We need to have critical component of these coming together so that we're having these transitions which are going to happen really fast and be disruptive come together. 
And this is extremely challenging. It's really going to require government, instead of being a small thinker, to actually be prepared to push the boundaries and do things differently. And the thing is, it's about 80 years since we last had that. And generationally, it means that most of the people who are there making decisions and are policy makers today haven't experienced that in recent time. And it means, though, that our neoclassical economics and democracy really has to be challenged and thinking, is this the way we're going to operate? If we go and look at the book by Samuel Huntington, it's raised this really obvious thing when you think about it, and that is that the clash of our ideals and, the, and of governance, that's when we see the greatest upheavals in history. And I think if we're not careful and we don't get our policy settings right and our engagement with technology and policy right, we're going to have that problem. So public policy is important because we need to make sure that we're not just looking at an individual, but we're actually looking at the whole society and that we have good outcomes for all. So we have, uh, well, we don't have haves and have-nots. We need to make sure that we have this transitioning and chaining of jobs in, in a, set up in a way that we bring everyone with us and no one's left behind. We have to get across the idea of the um, problems with uh, privacy desires, security and sustainability, and the desire, do we have a nanny state or do you have complete liberty? Or do we have a, a situation where the generations are having different expectations? And all of these require us to take a, into account things such as the political process changing, social media being a big impact on how we operate today, Intel, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and around the corner, quantum computing, which will just revolutionise the sort of information that we have and the way we engage with the world around us. So the question is, who actually makes policy? So is it the Australian government? Well, I guess so, but I want to ask a question about whether or not that is it alone. So policy changes do happen because of political imperatives, the agenda of the, pers of the, of the, of the um, party that's in, in power at the time. But the thing is, this has to change now because science and technology is really pushing the boundaries of what we have to think about in policy settings to make this all work. Now, this is a really crummy diagram I've put together to try and get in my mind to see how these all, things, all these things fit together. In the centre, we've got society, we've got researchers and academics on, on one part, we have industry driving the agenda because we need to have a successful economy, and we've got government making decisions, and you can see money flows and decision making and support and taxes and information and knowledge sharing happening. And at the end of the day, these things feed in and if you look at these lots of little dots, bits of information coming in, there's de many different ways that government engages in order to be able to get the most information to make good, good outcomes. But the thing that is really critical is that you don't sit back and say, it's the government's fault, the government needs to do this. In actual fact, it should be us engaging with government in order to be able to make sure these policy settings are what are needed. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking now at what is it that we need to have from a government to make it agile and responsive. So a first thing is it has to be adaptable. We need it to be able to meet the challenges that are coming up against us. They need to be innovative and be able to generate new ways of doing things. And I've put in red here the importance of collaboration because that where is where we come in. And it has to have visibility. That means transparency across everything that is being done. As soon as things are being held close to the chest, we have no way of seeing whether there's mistakes or, or, or possibilities of things going off at a tangent and having outcomes which are unexpected and unintended. And finally, it has to be done fast. This is not something that can be done incrementally. And with the technologies accelerating, we need to have government and policy aligning their decision making to keep up with this. So this needs us to have partnerships. We need to have strong leadership. We need to recognise the human capital, particularly in the public service, as it is the one that implements government policy. We need to make sure that the technologies that are supporting all these decision-making are right. And we need to make sure that we capitalise on the extraordinary diversity that we have in the world and in our society. If we don't do that, we're going to end up with roadblocks and we need to remove them. We need to move away from that, yes, minister, and that's a brave decision, to something which is also a place where it's not just government in a bubble and that's something we have to see is broken down. 
So what are the actions? The first thing is that policymakers need to be innovation changers. They need to have free time and stop being on this mouse wheel that goes round and round, treading around, so that we don't have time to stop and think. We need to make sure that we have an environment that allows experimentation, just as we have with technologies and experimenting in science to figure out what's the best way to do things. We also need to have the ability to make policy that might be a little bit wrong at times, and we can pull back and correct it. We need to make sure that we reward innovative thinkers and new ways of thinking. And we need to accept that we're going to get it wrong sometimes. And what's more important than anything else is the need to reach out to us to make sure that society is along the way in the good policy settings. So ideas to achieve this. Partnering, I've mentioned already, both public and private, is absolutely critical. We want to leverage innovation. We want to make sure that we respond to citizen expectations. And we also want to deliver new ways of doing, uh, new services and new ways of doing that. We need to rethink, what is a public service career? Is it something where we have public service and we have uh, private enterprise and we don't actually have the crossing over of that? We need to make sure that the competencies for agility are there, that we need to make sure that we respond to, again, to citizen expectations. And we need to make sure that, again, strong leadership and diversity are taken into account. We need to, a, a, a society that's willing to take risks and also recognise that when things don't work, that they will make adjustments. But there's also the recognition of young professionals are thinking about careers which are completely different than I could ever dream of. And the willingness to have the flexibility, the rewards, and the ability to have a very different career path than the one that I know I had and many of you might have experienced. And we need to be willing to redesign the business rules because we can't function with the new technologies and the current approach. And finally, we have to recognise that governments do have a regulatory role, but we need to make sure that it's done in a uniform way, which brings on board all the things that we need to take into account so that we don't have the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. We shouldn't also be afraid of the fact that there's all these new technologies that can influence things from machine learning through to um, uh, social media that is already doing things in China with the social index or with um, Cambridge Analytics who were able to have an influence in various elections. What we need to do, though, is recognise that there are some thinkings, and I won't go into details here, but this young man here has put out a lot of thinking about how we should be using these technologies in a way which allows us to engage the broader population so that we are able to do policy development which is embracing all the opportunities of those around us. So, for example, new technologies that can improve the quality of a democratic process can allow us to spot, spot flaws, approach things and come up with ideas where, we haven't, uh, where we've had gaps and we, or we've uh, misunderstood how something will happen. So these are examples that are happening around the world now, Brazil, France, Spain. And these digital technologies, they can actually help us improve and replace democracy, but we're hearing more about that later. But just to let you know, we've already done that in a sort of a, a manual way recently. Although there was a whole lot of discussion about whether we should have had a postal vote or not, this was actually government beginning to shift the boundaries of how they think about things. And so when we ask, in a way, for uh, the general populace opinion about things, we do have to be careful that sometimes we get some unintended consequences, which can be quite humorous. I like Bodie McBuckface. So, imagine if we were able to use technology in a way that could allow government to actually see what were the full consequences of any of their policy settings and what their decisions are. And so, in my terrible pho photoshopping, I was wondering whether we should be looking towards having a government that every day in question time puts on its virtual reality set of goggles and sees what have they done that day and how does it impact them. So public te policy and technology really have to come together if we want to see the society we want to have so that I know that the dream of my science is turning into a technology that does make the world a better place. To do this, we must recognise it is complex. There's not one single solution. Old ways won't work. We have to make sure that we adopt new business models, that we have agility and a willingness to take innovation and risk to the greatest new heights 
that we have a long-term view, that there's transparency, and that we realise we have to invest in this. It doesn't come cheap. And at the basis of this, it's all about innovation and disruption. Thank you.